So here I have in front of me an old Bionics conversion kit that was donated to us by a customer. So this is a conversion kit that's at its end of its life. That means the lithium cells inside the battery have had enough cycles and usage on them that it no longer gives the kind of capacity and range that's necessary to be usable as a kit. Now with most e-bike batteries or e-bike systems, when the battery wears out, you would simply replace the battery and continue to use it for a new four, five, six years. The problem is that Bionics has gone out of business, and when Bionics engineered this kit, they engineered it to be proprietary. You can't just use any third-party battery and run the Bionics system. The system in the motor controller needs to talk with the battery and communicate it, and they've locked it so you can only use Bionics batteries. That's something we were always warning people about when it came to proprietary conversions like the Bionics. And just last year, lo and behold, that materialized. Bionics went bankrupt, they no longer produced these battery packs, and everyone who had invested in the Bionics ecosystem lost their avenue for ongoing battery replacements as their original batteries wore out. So in this case, if you want to continue to use your Bionics motor, there's only two options that enable you to proceed. One of them would be to open up the battery pack and replace all the cells that have worn out in that. That has the benefit that you're still using all the original Bionics controls of Bionics torque sensing, and it's basically like getting a new battery without paying the Bionics premium, but it means that you're still locked into Bionics' proprietary setup. You can't run a higher voltage system, you can't use a third-party battery. When that battery wears out, you'll again have to custom rebuild and replace all the cells that are inside the pack. There's another option you can do, which is to remove all of the internal controls that are in the Bionics motor and bring out the phase wires and the hall wires separately to use an external third-party motor controller. The benefit of doing that is that you're now in the open realm of open component standards. So you can use any brand of motor controller and you can use any battery pack down the road. The downside is that you'll lose the built-in strain gauge sensing of Bionics' control system and would most likely need to add a crank-based torque sensor if you want to have the same torque control. So in this video here, I'm going to demonstrate this ladder approach. We're going to take this Bionics motor, open it up, and remove the electronics that are built inside the hub, and instead free just the cables that are running the motor directly so that there's no circuitry in here. At the moment, you can see that the Bionics, cable, Bionics motor has a battery power cable in it and a special communications in order to communicate with the rest of the setup. When we rebuild this motor, what we're going to have, instead of two wires, is three phase wires for directly powering the motor, and we'll have a hall sensor plug in order to run the motor controller's hall decoding. So we're going to start by showing you how to open up the hub motor and do the motor controller replacement. Uh, in order to do this, you'll ideally have a gear puller, which will help to pull and separate the side cover shell and remove the stator from the inside, and a dead blow hammer, which is happily helpful to help tap open the, the sequence. So I'll start off by first just removing the freewheel that's on here. So look at how much I overlies the uh, so <laughs> tool. Yeah. Okay, so the side of the motor has a piece of tape on it to join the two seams together. I'm guessing this is only for, mostly for water ingress protection, prevent water from getting inside the hub. So now what we want to do is use the gear puller in order to push the stator core that way and pull one of the side covers off. Now before I do this completely, I'm going to mark, use a marker in order to produce an alignment point so that when we reassemble the motor, it will be possible to press it back and make sure that it's going back together in the same orientation as we dismounted it. Otherwise, there's a risk of having the spoke holes be somewhat misaligned. So it helps at this point to use a dead blow hammer in order to ensure that the crack is opening up uniformly around the perimeter rather than just one side opening and not the other. And we continue to use the gear puller to move that side cover shell out when it's nice and tight.
be, gonna be useful here. Be very careful. Okay. So you can actually see in this case the steel ring started to come out from this side but ultimately came out from that side. So I'm going to tap that actually back down. Okay, so here we have the insides of the bionics motor. Now actually we're more interested in the other side of the motor on this side here where the motor control electronics are. So we're going to remove the anti-rotation nut that's on the end of the axle so that we can remove this side plate and then actually access the motor controller which is what we want to take out and replace. So yeah, so this washer has a, a tapered conical fit, so it takes some force to get it off if it's been seized on there for a while. And now we should be able to pull this side cover off, again, using the gear puller, or you could just tap it with the dead blow. Uh, for future reference, it would help to remove this heat shrink sleeve before you tried to slide the axle out. That should pop right out. Great. So the nice thing about this bionics motor is that we can very easily see where the uh, components are that we want to bring out and run it with the third-party motor controller. You have one, two, three hall sensors embedded in the stator, and then we have the three phase wires that connect to the PCB. So we have one phase connection there, another phase connection there, another phase connection there. What you see here, this is the battery plus, um, and on the other side, you'll see the battery minus. Those are not gonna go through the motor axle anymore. We wanna bring out phase A, phase B, phase C, and we wanna bring out hall A, hall B, and hall C. Now, if we look on the other side of the axle, we can see where Bionics has machined a flat section on the axle and installed the strain gauge. So the strain gauge is connected to the Bionics controller circuit board with a two-wire single-ended connection. Um, in theory, it would be possible to build your own strain gauge amplifier circuitry and amplify it and take advantage of this existing strain sensor to amplify it and control the bike using a version 3 cycle analyst is beyond the scope of what most people are going to be able to have the means to do. So for us, we're just going to focus on three phase wires and the three hall signal wires, and that'll make this a general purpose rear hot motor that we can use with any motor control. Ah, so to desolder these wires, we want to use uh, soldering iron as hot as you can get it because the phase wires have quite a bit of heat capacity to absorb. Battery plus. Battery ground. And then the last thing are the hall wires here. So they've got the hall wires using these long header pins. We're going to redo this using thin stranded wire. Uh, so we have no need for this part of the header. And what we can actually, if you notice, <laughs> um, the hall sensor is actually not glued inside here. Um, so these hall sensors, as soon as I remove the wire leads that hold them in place, they'll probably bounce out of there. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to snip the wires down here so that I can take advantage of the glue that's holding the leads to the hall sensor. If I desolder it up here, we'll actually not have any support for the halls unless we separately glue them in place. That circuit board can almost entirely come out except for the one last wire that I forgot here and that's the strain gauge. So the two wires that go to either side of the strain sensor. Um, there's also a communications cable. There we go. Okay, there it comes. Okay, so now we can remove the original cable harness, which serves no purpose anymore. 
So next step, we have to decide what we're going to use as the cable harness that goes through the motor. So here at Grin, we're quite fond of the cable with the L1019 connector plug, which is a nice locking waterproof connector. And it's going to let us add, in addition to the hall sensors, an additional thermistor so that we can monitor the motor temperature when we make this external motor controller compatible plug on here. So here's the cable that we're going to use to bring out the phase hall and temperature sensors. Uh, but it's a round diameter cable, and there's no way that it's going to fit through the side of the axle with the ball bearing. So they've machined this axle with a flat on it, and in order for the wires to fit through that, we need to strip back the sleeve, flatten them out, and then put a piece of heat shrink over it in a flattened state so that it'll match the cavity left open between a flat axle and a round inside bearing surface. And we'll then be able to wrap the wires uh, through this slot in the axle back over to the surface where we will be able to connect it to the three phase wires and the whole side. So wiring up the hall sensors is actually pretty optional. You can run directorized motors like this sensorless very easily with most motor controllers, but there are some benefits for the torque and power right off the line to taking advantage of the hall sensors that are already in the motor. Now the hall sensor chips here have a pinout that goes five volts on the left, ground in the middle, and then the hall output is on the right. So we're gonna to link together the five volts between all these hall sensors, and we're gonna to link together the middle ground pin on all the hall sensors, and then each of the signal wires for the hall is gonna to go to one of the colored hall signal wires that we have in our uh, motor phase cable. Now there are different, now there are different color pinouts here. Typically we use yellow, green, and blue for the halls, and yellow, green, and blue for the motor phase wires, uh, but there's no universal meaning on what's yellow, what's green, what's blue. Uh, in the course of working on this Bionics motor, we're going to be mating this with a phase runner motor controller, which automatically maps out the hall and the phase pinouts. So we really don't care which color goes to which of these phase wires. If you're using this with another motor controller that does have a specific pinout requirement, then your best bet is to uh, you have no real idea when the motor is open which is which, but then you can at the connector and switch around the pins of your hall sensor or redo the wires in order to get the right pin out that runs the motor smoothly. So now we've got all of the hall signal wires wired up to the hall signal wires in the cable. Um, what I noticed in doing this though is that these hall sensors are really quite loose and I don't want to be counting just on this little bit of hot glue to hold them in place. So we're going to add some five minute epoxy to better secure them in position since they're no longer attached directly to the motor controller circuit board. And we're also going to, while we have the epoxy made up, glue in a thermistor. This is a 10K thermistor that we can use for temperature sensing. And I'm going to put that right inside the copper winding. So it's touching the hottest part of the stator and we'll be wiring up the thermistor to the gray wire of the L10 connector cable. So now we've glued in place the hall sensor wires and the thermistor. We've completed the thermistor wiring and all we have left to do are the three phase wires. So I've pre-tinned these so that they've both got heavy beads of solder on the end of them. We'll slide on a piece of heat shrink tubing to cover those joints and then that will complete all of the internal electrical wiring in order to bring out the necessary cables. Just gonna fast, fast track all this stuff. And the last thing that we're going to do before we reassemble the motor shell is use cable ties through these existing holes that are inside the stator support in order to hold down all of these wires so that they're snug against the inside stator core and don't risk rubbing against the side curve of the motor and strafing through the insulation and causing shorts. So the only thing not yet terminated in all this wire assembly are the two white and blue wires that connect again to the strain gauge that's on the axle. Um, so if we wanted to do something really fun and experimental, we could try to bring out the strain gauge wires. Um, if I measure them, they're 350 ohms. Uh, 350 ohms is a very standard um, strain gauge resistance, um, but it's just a single leg of a bridge. So you'd have to build a full uh, Wheatstone bridge around that 350 ohm standard 
um, in order to amplify, in order to create a small signal that could be amplified to give a proportional strain. In this build, we're just going to leave those wires tucked inside the motor, um, but that is an option that would be out there for people who really want to take this hack to the extreme. The one last thing we're going to do before we reassemble this motor is add a stator aid injection hole. So we're going to drill out one of the disc rotor screws to go all the way through to give us a point for adding stator aid. That will give us the ability to greatly increase the continuous power that this little motor is able to produce. And if we're hacking the motor to use a third party controller, we might as well increase the power capability to well beyond what the original Bionics motor system was doing. Well, that's a little bit embarrassing. So we are just about to show how to reassemble the motor and put the side cover through here when we realize that the L10 connector plug that we installed on this cable harness is just a tad too small to fit inside the, what I believe is a 17 millimeter ball bearing on the motor axle. Um, so that means that to actually put the motor back together, I have to snip this cable, snip the connector right off, which kind of defeats the purpose of a nicely overmolded plug. Um, if you really wanted to do this and use this connector, you would want to feed this cable through the side cover and the ball bearing before you actually went ahead and did all the soldering inside of that. Uh, that is naturally one of the downsides of older molded connectors and why for the longest time we were using Anderson and JSTs because we could easily crimp them on the ends of any connector cable. Um, but sucks for us, this nice super clean Bionics upgrade is going to get a chop and uh, now we can put this thing back together. Uh, so whenever you're reassembling a motor, um, you have to be exceptionally careful of the magnetic forces that cause the stator to want to slam back into the rotor itself. You don't want to get your fingers pinched or anything like that. Um, actually, I've got the, uh, um, the cable comes out the disc side, not the freewheel side. Um, so we can uh, feed this through here, and then what we're going to do is carefully uh, tease it uh, with the um, motor wires to ensure that we don't crush anything. Um, I may want it to have pulled back the insulation. Oh no, that's good. Looks like it's fitting over top of the cable quite nicely. And then work the bearing into the side cover cell. Um, and so now comes the exciting part where we put on the two magnetic pieces, which will slam with some ferocity. So first you want to eyeball line up the markings that we installed when we started this. Um, and now you want to be very careful not to get your fingers uh, stuck inside. And bam! Uh, what we want to do now is uh, tap the two halves together. We can do that just with the dead blow hammer. So with a little bit of cable surgery to re-splice in the wires for a waterproof connector, we're now back to where I want it to be, which is having a Bionics motor terminated with our new L10 uh, universal motor plug that has the temperature, hall sensors, and speedo all built in. Um, and uh, this pretty much completes the transformation. One last thing we'd want to do is put heat shrink over the cable where it goes to the axle just to prevent it from rubbing against the uh, boss that holds the disc rotor mount. So that'd be one final step necessary to ensure uh, things don't run there. Uh, but now we've got it connected up to our phase runner motor controller and we're able to um, launch our auto-tune process. So, in our so the uh, Bionics motor, when it was opened, it had 22 magnets around the perimeter. So this means there's 11 pole pairs. Um, and it's now determining the winding resistance and the winding inductance. And now we launch the spinning motor test. Um, and this is where the phase runner suite is gonna do the automatic mapping of the hall sensors in order uh, to figure out which hall corresponds to which phase orientation. And it also determines the winding speed, the KV of the motor, uh, the auto tune completed. So here is the hall map. This particular hall map is completely arbitrary based on which colored wires I connected to which of the hall sensors. Uh, we're at 8.6 RPM per volt. And then that completes the tuning with the phase runner. If we look at our dashboard, we can see that hall sensors, if I rotate the motor slowly um, in the forest direction, you'll see the state of the halls switching and then it, the position of the current rotor moving its way from zero, one, two, three, four, five, as I spin the wheel. And now, if I hit the throttle, we should have, ta-da, power. 
Um, so why would you go through all this effort of repurposing an old Bionics to get rid of its internal controller and run it externally? Um, obviously, we're shedding the proprietary electronic drive, allowing this Bionics hub to now work with any motor controller and any battery pack. Um, one of the things about this Bionics motor is that it has extremely low cogging drag. So while well, you can get pretty inexpensive direct drive hub motors these days, they tend to have more resistance when you're just pedaling on a bicycle. So for people who are after a very low drag direct drive motor, this old Bionics PL350 is actually a pretty solid hub in spite of its age in that regard. And by enabling the use of external motor controllers, we can now run this motor with more power and more speed than it was ab ever able to do in a Bionic system. And as we've demonstrated, the addition of stator aid inside the hub greatly improves its shedding capability. So you can now push this motor to higher power levels, even though the motor itself is the same size. Um, is it worth... <laughs> The other thing is that Bionics motor systems like this are probably a dime a dozen these days, and so it would be an easy thing to get for free or scrap and have a perfectly viable hub motor if you're willing to put in the effort uh, to gut the internal electronics as we just demonstrated. Okay. Tell your fans you love them. We love you!